the reason I chose this, this topic is because it's, it's truly important. It's a, it's a topic that we don't fully understand, I believe. The more that I studied into this, the more that I realized that uh, we need to understand exactly how dangerous this carnal mind is, how damaged we are at birth because of it, the impossibility of rehabilitating ourselves and most importantly, the blindness of God's people to the pervasive control of their carnal minds and how it holds power over them in their lives. If we don't comprehend this curse and accept our responsibility in allowing it to control us, then it's just about impossible to receive a spiritual mind, which will be my next topic later on today. From the earliest time in our lives, the carnal mind rules us. But it's not for our good. There's nothing good in a carnal mind. It is destructive, it brings confusion, lack of, and lack of true spiritual zeal. Uh, one of the best verses here to uh, describe the carnal mind. Familiar with that verse, right? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And I, I wanted to get a little bit more insight on that. Desperately wicked, right? Here's the Greek to that. To be frail, feeble, or figuratively, to be melancholy. Isn't that interesting? To be melancholy. Desperately wicked, incurable. All right, that's pretty, that's a good description. Sick and woeful. Now, if, if that's all that we understood about the carnal mind, it would be enough to shun it, to say, no, I'm not having this thing rule in my life. Who of us here would think to have a person who has this type of personality rule in our lives? Nobody. It just doesn't make any sense. No, I, I wouldn't want somebody that you knew telling you what to do who had that kind of mind. But yet, somehow, we think that it's okay to let it rule us, and we're just going to go along with it. We're not as vehemently opposed to it as it is to godliness. The reason we have regrets and shame and guilt and weakness in our lives is because we yield to the carnal mind. It is an enemy that must take more seriously than we ever had before. Every person born after Adam and Eve's son have inherited this carnal mind. And we've inherited a fallen nature, which includes the carnal mind. And we see this noted in Genesis 3, 5, right? And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his own image and called his name Seth. And today, we don't think much about being born carnal. It's like, that's natural, you know, it's just the way we're born. But when this first happened, God took this so seriously that he invoked the plan that he had created with his son to save us from this carnal mind. Because this carnal mind will lead us to where? Death. That's clear in the scripture. We have every reason for ceaseless gratitude to God that Christ, by his perfect obedience, has won back the heaven that Adam lost through disobedience. Adam sinned, and the children of Adam share his guilt and its consequences. But Jesus bore the guilt of Adam, and all the children of Adam that will flee to Christ, the second Adam, may escape the penalty of transgression. This plan was a painful plan for God to put into place because it involved the death of his son. And it, the suffering did not just end at the cross. The suffering of God still continues on because of his deep love for us. And he sees what's going on in our world, in our lives, and particularly in his remnant church. So the flesh gets sick, gets old, and it dies. The carnal mind is the instigator. We hear this and we read this. We need to know about this. 
For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. In other words, when certain parts of our body, or Paul calls them the members of our body, when they crave something, when they desire something, the carnal mind will do everything that it can to accommodate its desires and defends its action at the expense of life, health, and even other people. And we see this take place when Adam and Eve uh, inherited the carnal mind instantly after they sinned. What did Adam do when he was asked, why did you do this? Her. It's not my fault. It's her fault. But, and you gave her to me. So really, it's not my fault at all. This is the carnal mind. And that carnal mind has been getting progressively worse as time goes. More deceptive, more evil, more wicked, more deceitful. And so this is why Jesus warns us, don't be deceived. Be very careful about what you hear and what you accept as truth. And as we saw there, one of the descriptors of desperately wicked, uh, this carnal mind, is melancholy, right? Self-pitying, this self-pitying mind. I remember one time in 1986, I chose to turn my back on the Lord. And I left the church for 10 years. And during that period of time, I don't know how it happened, but my mind became so self-pitying. I was so full of self-pity that even if somebody mentioned something to me about my color, I would start to cry. I got depressed and suicidal because of this carnal mind that led me to this self-pitying state. And so you can see that, you know, that it gets melancholy. There's full of self-pity. And you know who kind of came to mind when I was thinking of this? Do you remember the story of Amnon? He was so sick, he made himself sick. He wanted his sister, half-sister Tamar to serve him or, or to, you know, he wanted to be with her essentially. So Jonadab, his cousin, comes in and gives him this great plan which he adopts and then what happens, you know? That's, that's what this, this carnal mind will do to us. It will deceive us into thinking that these most crazy ideas that are wicked are okay and acceptable, especially with our own selves, right? This mind is after the flesh or it wants to be in harmony with the flesh. That's its goal. What does the flesh want? I want to do it. I'll do everything that I can. And why does it do that? Because the flesh, listen carefully, and the mind are married. All right? The flesh and the mind are married. And we see this spoken of in Romans 7, verses 1 to 5. We're not going to turn there, but it's mentioned there. I want to mention something that you're probably aware of, but just in case, if we're living a life described in Romans 7, verses 14 to 24, which says, that which I want to do, I don't do. But the evil that I want to do, that I do. If we're living like that, if that is our experience, we're being led by the carnal mind. There's no other way to look at that. All right? While every human being has been f born with this fallen nature, not everyone was born with the carnal mind. Only one, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, was born with a spiritual mind. He did not have a carnal mind like we are born with. So, he had an advantage in that sense, but he offers us the privilege of having a spiritual mind. One of the problems of having the carnal mind is that we cannot control it. We cannot change it. We can't modify it. <clears throat> There's nothing that we can do to restore our minds back to the way that it was before the fall. Only Christ <clears throat> has that power. And it's not possible 
for us to replace that carnal mind in our own strength. Not only can we not control it, but it is vehemently opposed to the spiritual mind. And we have to have the spiritual mind because the spiritual mind is the only thing that can subdue this carnal mind. It will not tolerate truth. And it will not allow truth to reach our hearts. The carnal mind does not want that to happen. Now these are all pretty basic things that we all should know. We should all understand this. The reason I'm bringing this out is because we need to understand how serious this condition is and what we can do to escape it. That's the point, right? I don't want to just stand here and say how bad the carnal mind is and then sit down. That's not going to help us, right? We want some solutions. We want some answers to this. I believe that the main reason we are not overcoming in our lives is because we don't understand the power of the carnal mind. And if we don't understand the power of the carnal mind, it's like a person that doesn't know that they're sick. If you don't know you're sick, you won't go to get help. You won't go to a naturopathic doctor. <laughs> right? You won't know to take natural remedies. You're just going to keep on going the way that you are because you, there is no problem, right? And if we think that our failing spiritual condition is normal and we're comfortable with that, why would we want change? What would be like Paul, right? I was once alive without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died, right? We can get to a place where we are very comfortable with this carnal mind and not desire to have a savior or to even think that we need a savior, what do we do? We end up relying upon the knowledge that we have in the scripture. We end up relying upon the good works that we do for other people and think that that's okay. Meanwhile, the carnal mind has not changed. It's still there, deceptively working its way to our destruction. If we don't see our need for victory over it in our lives, we will remain carnal minded. And to be carnal minded is not a good thing. We've read these verses before. For to be carnally minded is death. For if we live after the flesh, we are going to die. There are two the flesh and the carnal mind. The flesh craves, the, the flesh wants this and that. The carnal mind says, yes, I'm going to do that for you. Those two are married together. There needs to be something that happens in order for that to change. One of those two has to die. Which one do you think it is? Carnal mind. Right, because what happens if the flesh dies? <laughs> The carnal mind will die too. <laughs> we won't have any hope, right? We'll end up dying in our sins. I try to enforce upon the people that sins not repented of are sins not forgiven. Those who think themselves forgiven of sins which they have never felt the sinfulness and over which they have never felt contrition of soul only deceive themselves. Now that's serious, right? So this is why we need to have a spiritual mind, because if we have the carnal mind, we're not going to think much about the sins that we commit, because the carnal mind is going to go right along with it and say, that's okay, let's blame somebody. Let's find a reason for why this is okay. In fact, I will give you more reasons so you can continue to live that way. This is not good. And I think that we need to become more serious and realize the danger of this carnal mind. Mm -hmm. Let's see if you can get here. Paul said that we will die in our sins unless something is done about the carnal mind and the flesh. Again, the carnal mind is determined to rule us and we must receive the promise of the Father to destroy it. The way to overcome it has already been prepared. So when we learn about how bad our condition is and the Holy Spirit does his work of conviction 
and condemnation sets in, we will be driven to the Savior who is waiting to impute and impart his righteousness, which is the Holy Spirit, to the repentant, believing sinner. Whether it's a new believer or one of the remnant that has sinned. The carnal mind, again, cannot be modified. It must die. And I'm going to say something here that you might not like, but only 1% of the remnant know how to deal with this. All right? Only 1%. How can I say such a thing? Is that, that's, am I trying to shock everybody? Mm -mm. Here, let's read it. There is not one in 100 who understands for himself the Bible truth on this subject that is so necessary to our present and eternal welfare. When light begins to shine forth to make clear the plan of redemption to the people, the enemy works with all diligence that the light may be shut away from the hearts of men. Now notice she didn't say from the eyes of men but from the hearts, because this is where truth must reach. We can't just see it and allow it to remain in our minds. It has to come down to our hearts because the carnal mind will not, will not be affected unless we reach, it reaches our hearts. Grace includes an attribute that most of us have forgotten or in some cases have never learned. The only thing that can destroy the hold on the carnal mind, and it's the only thing that can enable us to believe to the point of freely claiming the merits of Christ and with certainty say, Christ is my righteousness. That attribute is a gift called repentance. And we're gonna get into that for a minute. Please listen carefully. When Adam and Eve sinned, something happened to their minds that they could not change and only a divine intervention could heal them the damage was deep and it was complete if they were left the way that they were there would be no hope something had to happen for them to begin to appreciate even shortly after they began to sin in order for them to want spiritual things They lost the mind of Christ. They could not believe that God loved them and would pardon them. That was not within their mind. They couldn't do that anymore. That loving character of Christ that they had experienced now was changed. And there was no escape. They had, Spirit of Prophecy tells us, they had become one with Satan. And you think, how could that happen so quickly? Well, let me put it this way in, in language that we can understand. If you're married and your spouse is unfaithful, how quickly does that change the relationship? Instantly. It's not the same. It's dead, right? <clears throat> they were hiding. They were ashamed and they were trying to justify themselves, which only would com continually keep them in the, carnal in the carnal mind. The mind that we're left with is called the carnal mind and it is in harmony with Satan. Nothing they could do could stop that mind. Nothing they could do could stop them from thinking selfishly. The only way that they could be brought to saving faith, faith was through the example of the sacrifice that Christ would offer for them and for the world. Adam sacrificed the first animal for their sins. The first thing that happened in this sacred ceremony was that Adam repented because the animal was brought, it's a lamb. Adam places his hands upon the head of the lamb and confesses his sin. When he's doing this, do you think there's repentance and sorrow in his heart? Absolutely. Absolutely, because now he be, he's beginning to realize what he's done, what was it that caused him 
to, to understand this, the loving character of Christ and the fact that he had to take an animal for his sin, which represented what Christ would do for them. When that realization set in, they were broken. They didn't want this to happen. They said no. They didn't want Christ to die. But that was the only way in which they could be delivered. That was the only way that they could regain paradise and to be brought back in harmony with God. Without that gift, they would not have been able to believe what Christ promised them. And why do I say that? No impenitent. Now listen to this carefully. This is not a punishment. This is a result of sin. No impenitent sinner can believe with his heart unto righteousness. Repentance is described by Paul as godly sorrow for sin. That worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. This repentance has nothing in, it of, in the nature of merit, but it prepares the heart for the acceptance of Christ as the only hope, the only savior, the only hope of the lost sinner. And that, brothers and sisters, is why John the Baptist preached repentance to the whole nation of Israel, so that their hearts could be ready to receive Christ as the Messiah. The ones who repented and were baptized believed in him. The ones who didn't repent, who were the religious leaders, the scribes and Pharisees, they didn't believe John. They weren't baptized. And what did they end up doing? They didn't believe that he was the Messiah. In fact, they couldn't believe that he was the Messiah because they had refused the Holy Spirit working upon their hearts and in their minds so that they could be, their hearts can be softened. So what insight do we receive from that statement that we just read? Well, the way in which we are pardoned and receive the promise of the Spirit of the Father is specific and will not take place if it's done after, if it's not done after the order of God. But repentance and pardon are miracles. We have to understand this. These things are miracles. There's something that we cannot do. Repentance destroys the carnal mind. It destroys the unbelieving, rebellious power of the carnal mind, and it brings forgiveness with the mind of Christ. Here's what I mean. To be pardoned in the way that Christ pardons is not only to be forgiven, but to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. The Lord says, a new heart will I give unto thee. The image of Christ is to be stamped upon the very mind, heart, and soul. The apostle says, and we have the mind of Christ. Without the transforming process, which can come alone through, uh, alone through, the div through divine power, the original propensities to sin are left in the heart in all their strength to forge new chains to impose a slavery that can never be broken by human power. Think of that. That is powerful. So we need to be pardoned in the way that Christ pardons. And if we don't, we don't understand. We're never going to change. So that, to me, is important because my, my goal in, in this Christian life is not just to accumulate knowledge. My goal in this walk is to be transformed, to be changed. Amen. I want a new life. Amen. I want to live a life of victory. Amen. I have no interest in living a failure life. No. What good is that? I may as well just turn back to the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to live a life that's victorious. I want to prove to not just myself, but to everybody that God's way does work. Amen. Christ came here to show us that. How can we deny it? He came here to show us exactly how we can have victory over every single thing in our lives. Why are we not doing it? 
I want to know that answer. I'm not satisfied with just going along as things are in this Laodicean dead state of, of mind. So, we have the answer. Christ has given us that answer. And it is a beautiful answer that has much meaning and power. So if we are living the life of Romans 7, 14 to 24, we can be sure that according to what we've just read, we have not been pardoned. And if we haven't been pardoned, that's because we have not experienced the gift of repentance. Because what does repentance do? It prepares the heart for us to receive Christ as our personal Savior. And when we receive Christ as our personal Savior, what do we get? We get the imputed righteousness of Christ and the imparted righteousness of Christ, which is the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, the promise of the Father. And the reason we have not experienced or received this gift is because we have allowed our carnal minds to rule us, not seeing our need of rejecting it or answering God's call, continually calling us to repentance. It's that enmity against God and his law. And if we're trying to be in harmony with it and have the carnal mind, it's not going to happen. We have to recognize it. So it will reject the grace of the gift of repentance because it hates it. Because if repentance is received, it will die. It takes a miracle to save us and to bring us back into harmony with God. The carnal mind at the instigation of Satan wants to accept any false gospel so that they can stay alive. Whatever false gospel that comes along, it wants it. It will proclaim it. It will be religious. It will seem powerful. But the carnal mind will still be in control. This is deceitful. We have to be careful with this thing. It's worse than any virus. But the great news is that where sin abounds, Grace say it, come on. <laughs> Grace does much more abound. We want this grace. It's available to us. And in our next presentation, we'll see the beautiful plan of salvation revealed. And here's a taste of it. This is what started me on this journey seven years ago. My wife was reading the book that I may know him, I think it was. No, The Faith I Live By. And she shared this uh, paragraph with me. And I was searching at the time. I was thinking, what can I do to overcome this? I'm really dissatisfied with my life. I don't want to live like this anymore. And so she read this to me. <clears throat> the thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part. Amen? Yes. Amen. But as a free gift from God is a precious thought. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. And I heard that and I said, read that again. And she read it again. And that was the beginning for me. From that moment on, I could not stop searching for the gift of righteousness by faith. I could not put it down. I talk about it everywhere. That's all I talk about. I mean, it's a few other things, but primarily it's going to be righteousness by faith. And why is that? Because I need it. I need it. I, I need to know what's going on in the world, but not as much as I need to know that my relationship, my union with Christ is solid, secure, and that I'm going to be resurrected if I die or translated if Jesus comes. And I don't need to have any doubt about that. <clears throat> now, here's something about the carnal mind. And I mentioned a bit before. We need to understand this. Even if you're told that you have eternal life, even if you're told that Jesus died for your sins, even if you're told that Jesus was resurrected so that you could have justification, even if you're told that Jesus is in heaven working for your salvation, 
that does not change the carnal mind. Do you understand? This is something that as Adventists we need to get a hold of in our mind and in our heart because we are a people that has a lot of knowledge. And we think that this knowledge, which leads us to being rich and increased with spiritual goods, we, ha we think we have need of nothing. But the heart is not reached. And so as a result of that, we end up doing all kinds of strange things. And we have a lot of strange beliefs now that I never thought would ever come into this church. You've, I'm sure you've heard of some of them. I don't even want to repeat them right now, but why? Why do we have these strange beliefs? Because the carnal mind is getting desperate. It knows, along with its father, that it has but a short time to live, right? And soon, and very soon, the Lord will come. But just prior to his coming, there's going to be a loud cry. And in this loud cry, the message of righteousness by faith is going to be sounded with power and great glory. And those people who hear that, who are in the fallen churches, will say, well, where do I go? Well, we can tell them where to go. We can invite them to come and drink of the water of life freely. And we need to warn them. That will be also reason for them to seek the truth. Warnings are given in the scripture and in the spirit of prophecy so that we don't go along merrily thinking that our sinful life and are led by our carnal mind is fine and it's okay and everything's going to work out. We can't have that. God is so desiring to save us. He does not want us to be deceived. He wants us to be with him for eternity. He wants to save us. He wants to see us as his children and us acknowledging that and living the power that he, with the power that he's given to us. God has a solution for this dilemma, but it's not what many people think and not what many people come to believe. And it's actually a mystery that very few people will embrace. As a result of Adam's disobedience, every human being is a transgressor of the law, sold under sin. Unless he repents and is converted, he is under bondage to the law, serving Satan, falling into deceptions of the enemy, and bearing witness against the precepts of Jehovah. But by perfect obedience to the requirements of the law, man is justified. Only through faith in Christ is such obedience possible. Men may comprehend the spirituality of the law. They may realize its power as a detector of sin, but they are helpless to withstand Satan's power and deceptions, and unless they accept the atonement provided for them in the remedial sacrifice of Christ, who is our atonement, our atonement. I think I misread that. But you've, you read it. I think you got it, right? So there's something there that's powerful, right? We need to understand. I think you probably get the point, right? Repentance is key. This is really something that if you think back the past 50 years or so, the ch all churches have not mentioned that word. You can go to any church just about today and you won't hear a word about it. You will hear about forgiveness. You'll hear about reconciliation. You'll hear about how much God loves you. And those things are important. But they will be um, not as appreciated if we don't receive that gift of repentance and exercise it. Because what happens again, think of this, always remember this. No impenitent sinner can believe unto righteousness. That is a law. It's the carnal mind. If it, because once we repent, the carnal mind loses its power. Now we are made ready and capable of believing. So if we don't repent, we're in serious trouble. Why is it then that we're not repenting? Why is it that we don't take the counsel of Christ when he says to the remnant church, be zealous, therefore, and repent? 
And what's going to happen if we repent? What follows that? I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. What's going on there? What is he saying? He's saying that once you repent, the process of eating together is a symbol of righteousness by faith. Here's why I say that. When we bring our sacrifice, or when a sacrifice was brought to the uh, priest, there was something that took place, right? The confession of sin, the transfer of sin from man to the animal, to the blood, to the priest, to the sanctuary. In some cases, the priest had to eat of the sacrifice, which means he partook of the sin, he bore the sin. So he's, that's what he's saying, I'm going to take your sin, and when you eat of me, he said that in John chapter 6, when you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, then you will have life eternal. So there's a, an exchange of sin for righteousness through this beautiful process of repentance. I don't know about you, but when I first began to understand this, it was like, this is the key. This is, this is it. This is, and I began to see it everywhere. Repentance is all throughout the Bible in every way that I had no idea was there. For example, um, we don't look at it as this very often, but repentance is grace. We can't repent of ourselves. We have worldly repentance, but we don't have godly repentance that leads to salvation. We don't have that. It's a gift. So God is continually calling and offering this gift. And if we don't accept it, what's going to happen? We have no hope. And so God says, by grace are you saved which includes repentance, through faith. So if you accept the gift or grace of repentance, you're made capable of being able to believe. And Paul preached that everywhere he went. Acts chapter 20, verse 20 and 21. He talks about that, you know, I have taught you publicly and gone from house to house, teaching about repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Everywhere he went, he, he taught that. And we have missed that gift. We have focused on the other gifts, but we have not focused on that. And so I think it's very important that we understand this. Again, the, danger, uh, the dangerous thing about not repenting is that we remain carnal, and we can hear the gospel, and we can choose to accept it, but we will not be converted and our hearts won't be changed. We may even become a minister or start a ministry and still be led by the carnal mind. This is why Paul wrote the words of the one who realizes this condition in Romans 7:24, "O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death?" Now, Interesting, he says, O wretched man that I am. What does Jesus say about the condition of the Laodicean church? Is that one of the words that he uses? Wretched. Do you notice that here Paul just says, O wretched man that I am? But when Christ is talking to the remnant church, he expounds and has four more descript descriptions of the, of the church. What does that tell us? We're in bad shape and we don't realize it. And this is our problem today. Most of us are carnal-minded, trying to live a spiritual life. It doesn't matter that Christ has died for our sins. That will not change our carnal minds. We can receive the gospel again, repeat it. That won't change our carnal minds. The gift of repentance is what changes the carnal mind. So how do we receive the carnal mind? I mean, the uh, gift of repentance. 
right? This is kind of like sounds weird because if you can't believe unless, unto righteousness unless you receive the carnal mind, then how do you believe to receive the, excuse me, the, the, the gift of repentance, right? Well, the same way that every person that was healed received healing from Christ, right? Think of the paralytic by the pool. Jesus came up to him, asked him if he wanted to walk. He says, I have no person to bring me to the pool when the water is troubled. Jesus looks at his eyes and says to him, get up and walk. He chose to believe. He willed and the power was supplied. The same thing happens for us when we accept that gift of repentance. It's a beautiful gift. It's, it, it is transformational because once it is experienced, righteousness by faith will be experienced as well. And Righteousness by faith is, as she says, is an experience. It's not just a teaching. It's something that you experience. It gives you a new life. It gives you the ability to see things in scripture that you have never seen before. You've read over it many times, but you, don't, you haven't seen it. Your eyes are opened. Your heart is subdued. You're softened. You can express compassion and love for other people. You know how to reach other people because you have been reached by the Spirit of God. You know the words to say, you know what not to say. And God is there to give you the blessing that you need. One more and then we'll, a couple more statements here and we'll end. If you are condemned, there is but one course for you to pursue. You must repent toward God because of the transgression of his law and have faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ as the one who only can cleanse from sin. If we would obtain heaven, we must be obedient to God's holy requirements. We're living in a time when the loud cry has already begun to sound in the message of righteousness by faith and it's only gonna get stronger and more powerful. We need to be a part of this. It's going to be a beautiful movement, but we must understand and we must open our hearts to the fact that repentance is something that we lack. We have people that we need to make things right with. There are some people that have a very difficult time of repenting, but once the Holy Spirit moves upon your heart and softens your heart, and it's happened with Denise and I, we used to get into arguments you know, in the past, and sometimes we wouldn't talk to each other for days. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, maybe none of you have, but we certainly did. And, but when this happened, it's like the minute you say something, something comes out of your mouth, it's like you realize right away, oh, Lord, please forgive me. And again, it, it happens and the Lord shows you that you must do this and he will provide that strength to do it in the most difficult of times and situations. For example, if you have gotten into this type of an argument, in type of argument with your, your spouse, and you realize that they're wrong, but you have said things in the wrong spirit, it is difficult to admit because you're, 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 you're right, right? But now you have to admit that you were wrong in the way that you, you said what you wanted to say. Yes. That the spirit that you had was not the spirit of Christ. That it was the spirit of Satan. And so this needs to be confessed. Every time that we sin, God is there waiting to hand us this gift. And the more that we accept it, the more we're going to become like Christ. She says, and I don't know where it's at, but as time goes, our, our repentance will deepen. And we're going to have this beautiful experience. And in the past, God has let certain things go, but now, as we read in the scriptures, and at the, time, and at, and the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth men everywhere to repent. So before I'd read that, I didn't notice the word commandeth. I just sort of saw it as like, well, God is just asking people to repent. It's pretty clear what it says there. It's important, right? If God is commanding us to repent, it's because he loves us. 
It's because he wants to save us. He wants us to be transformed. He no longer wants us to live our lives as failures and uh, being in bondage. Well, I hope this uh, was helpful to you. I hope that it has blessed you. I hope that you've learned something that you can take into your experience. And I hope that you continue to study this topic. Go through the spirit of prophecy in the Bible and search for the words repentance and faith. And you'll see some many, many things there on this subject. And it will bless you. And uh, I would suggest if you just want to read something, start in the book First Selected Messages. Start at the chapter, uh, chapter 46 and go straight through to the very end. I think there are 65 chapters or something like that in there. Read that and you will see their descriptions of what I'm talking about clearly. And you will see clear descriptions of righteousness by faith. And with that, I'm going to close with a prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for blessing us with this time. Thank you for the privilege we have of receiving that beautiful grace that has been so long neglected that Satan does not want us to even know about. We pray that you would work in our hearts, Lord, that our hearts might become soft so that we can believe from our hearts and that we can accept that which we are and come to you for healing, receive the promise of the Father, and live our lives as Christ lived his life. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.